Galatians chapter 4, and we left off on verse 17, so we'll pick up from there. <coughs> I isn't bad here. I should be in the kitchen. Okay, got it? Yeah. Galatians 4, 17, and then we'll read uh, first. 17 to 20. Would you read that for us? Yeah, uh, verse 17. Yeah. Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us, so you may have zeal for them. It is fine to have to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My, my dear children, from whom I am gained in the pains of childbirth until Christ is forming you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Amen. We'll stop there. Any questions? <clears throat> All right. So we'll jump in. Verse 17. Uh, these people are like Peter and those at Antioch who separate themselves. They did it so as to get the Gentiles to come along with their agenda of being circumcised. These people are zealous for the Galatians, but not uh, for the good of the Galatians. Uh, these agitators want to shut out the Galatians from the grace and blessings that are found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and they're doing it so that they'll become dependent upon them and their teaching. They want to use the Galatians as a form of boasting. You know, to be able to say they came into a territory where, where Paul was ministering. They came to Paul's converts, and then they convinced them to take on the Torah, to take on the law. Uh, that would be like a like a shiny star for them, you know. They would look good uh, with the other Jews who would, uh, you know, the the regular Jews, the non-Christian Jews. It, it would look good for them because it looked like, oh my goodness, they they they've gotten these Gentiles under control, and now they're they're following that. Uh, so Paul says, this is why they want to do it, they, and he's going to elaborate on that when he gets to chapter six. Uh, in verse eighteen, says it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Um, you know, in the ancient world, zeal uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the word in Greek, of course, is just like in English, zealos, zeal. And there's good zeal and bad zeal. Good zeal is when you're zealous for things that are, that are righteous, things that are good, things that are godly. When we're zealous for God, that's a good thing. Uh, when we're zealous for anything that's not God, that's a bad thing. And, of course, you can mistake you can mistake uh, ungodly zeal for zeal. You know, Paul certainly did that. Paul, you know, when, he, when in Galatians 1, when he's talking about the zeal that he has, he said that he was zealous, but his zealousness led to uh, trying to destroy the church. So he said, my zeal was not good. But again, he was mistaken. And he was, um, he was very zealous like, like Phinehas. He was zealous like Elijah. But it was a, it was a corrupt kind of seal, you know. It kind of reminds me of like um, the people that attacked on September 11, the the Muslims that attacked the towers. If you were to ask them, they would tell you that they're zealous, that they're zealous for God, that their cause is righteous, their cause is good, and so whatever they do is justified. And that's how Paul thought. Paul had that same kind of thinking. He thought it's okay to go and hunt down Christians. It's okay to get them bring the trial. It's okay to get them killed because uh, they're bad. And so it's they. He saw the zeal for God, and he says this is the reason God was merciful to him. God was merciful to him because God understood that he was not doing it out of impure motives. Uh, mm -hmm. He thought they were pure motives. He believed it was pure motives. He was just mistaken. Um, so there is a zeal that is good and a zeal that is bad. For as Christians, we have to be careful that we don't con we don't confuse our passions for zeal for god sometimes the christians will do things and they think that they're you know they're being evangelistic or they're being zealous for god but really what they're doing is being annoying uh, mm. or harming the christian cause you know uh, certainly as a young christian i was very zealous but at times i was zealous in the wrong kind of way where i, I overstepped the boundaries i harmed other people i did things i shouldn't have done so it's very easy you know that's not, you know that's why it's so so good to to have someone there to like help you and mentor you as a young Christian to realize don't mess up. I, I didn't have anyone when I was when I first got born again 
to really mentor me and to really help me to stay safe. Um, you know, and of course, Neil is also, it's good to be cautious, like uh, Gamaliel, Gamaliel in, uh, in the book of Acts, where they're, they're saying, we, you know, they want to persecute the, Christ, the Christians. And he says, you know, we should be careful. We should be careful. You know, if this is, if this is of God, we're going to end up fighting God. And if it's not of God, then he said it will resolve itself. It will end by itself. And that's a, that's a great, that's a wonderful philosophy to have, that he realized, look, if something is not from God, it will come to an end. It's not going to go anywhere. But if it's from God and you are opposing it, you're opposing God, which is <laughs> what, what Paul realized when he encountered Christ, that all the time he's thinking he's being zealous for God, he's actually being anti-God. He's actually zealous against the things of God. So he had to, uh, to do a 180 and to, uh, to reform himself or, or be reformed with the Holy Spirit. Any questions? 1920. My dear children, from whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Uh, Paul here switches the language. Remember before he was talking about the language of friendship and, you know, all the, all the qualities that he's demonstrating as a friend, and, you know, and now he turns into a family language. And not only family language, he turns to motherhood. You know, sometimes people, are, people don't realize, they're reading the Bible, they don't realize he's comparing himself to a mother mm -hmm. who is once again pregnant and about to give birth. And for him, the Galatians had not really been born yet. Now, the word he actually uses for morphous uh, to be formed it's actually the, the pain that occurs as the baby is being formed in the womb. He says, you're still in the womb. You still haven't really come out. You're still not really like Christ. And so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm back in my labor pains. I'm going through the whole thing all over again. It's something that should have passed already, and he should be okay. And, you know, the, you know, the baby should be getting older and growing up. He's thinking, you know, here we are doing it all over again. Like, like, I'm, like I'm, you know, I'm back in that, in that stage of pregnancy. And uh, he wishes, of course, uh, that he could be there, but he, but he cannot be. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, well, Paul longs to be, is to be formed and then brought to safe and healthy birth. Uh, and not, of course, just the only individual, but community. Sometimes, of course, Paul talks about the individual when he says, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. He's talking about his own, his own movement to uh, spiritual reawakening. But he also wants the church as a unit to to be molded into into the into christ so you know paul paul would never be content uh you know if paul came to our congregation and our congregation is pretty much like the, the new testament they, they didn't have very large congregations maybe you know 35 50 was the biggest you know they can have in a, in a house and he would never be content if he said oh yeah there there's eight of you or nine of you who are really being formed very nicely but the rest are not he would not be content with that. He would want to see the whole congregation, all believers together as the body of Christ, the body of Christ, not simply the individuals of Christ, mm -hmm. the body of Christ growing to that full maturity to having Christ formed in them. So again, both are important. Um, I think it's harder for us to, to deal with the corporate element. Uh, at least it is for me. Um, I'm very Americanized, so I'm very much into the individual. You know, I remember when I became a Christian, it was really about me. How do I grow? How do I mature? You know, it was about my prayer life and my spirituality and my everything. I really didn't think as a church, as a group. I remember the first time when I was in Bible college, I was reading The City of God by Augustine. And he kept talking about our salvation. Not my, our salvation. The whole, all believers being saved, all being together as a body. That I really, I was like, wow, I really, I, I lack that in my spirituality. And um, no matter how much I believe in it, in my mind, when it comes to boots on the ground, I feel that I'm, I'm still more individualistic. You always feel like, well, you know, how much can you really change people? And, you know, you feel I can change my, I can submit to the Holy Spirit, I can see my change in my life, but can the whole group change? And especially when you see the church today, you see people that are, that are maturing, they're growing, but you see others that just don't, 
they don't move. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't grow. They don't, they, they're like stagnant. They're, they're static. They're not, they're not moving forward. And of course, for me, the Christian life, I believe, I mean, honestly, I do believe in the Christian life. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. I don't really, I don't believe that people can just stay like on a plateau and hang out on a cliff in, a, in the Christian life. In the Christian life, it's almost like you're like on a hill, on a bicycle, and you're on roller skates. You're either going up, you're pushing up somehow, or you're going down. And, um, and these Christians would think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm stable. No, you're not stable. If you're stable, you're probably going down. Because the Christian life is something you always have to be constantly, you know, if you, if you neglect your prayer life, you neglect, neglect the word, neglect prayer, you know, all these, these things affect you. And, uh, but again, Paul would never be content with individuals maturing and the church being left behind. He would want the whole group. He doesn't want just a few Galatians to be there. He wants all the Galatian believers to grow to this, to the full stature of Christ, to be like Christ. Um, but again, I find that as a Christian, no matter how hard I try, I cannot, I'm, I'm not corporate. I don't think like a group because I'm an American and I really do think like individual. And um, no matter how much, how much I've tried to think that way, I still, my way of being is always the individual. You know, how do I develop as a Christian? And you no, know, even as a pastor, I just don't see people, you know, I think about how to, how to disciple individuals, how to help individuals in this way or that way, you know, but I can't think of the whole group because I, it just so difficult for me to think that way. Any questions, any comments? You know, the churches my both daughters go to, they go to different churches. They don't, well, she lives in a different state. They're always doing something in church. The mm -hmm. group. I mean, they have, the one church has a, a, had ground with a swimming pool. And when there's something going on, they all gather together and bring food and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, if it's a holiday and they don't have anything to do, they all go there. And they're always doing something. My daughter's always going on every week, one day a week. They all bring something. Yeah. See, and that's yeah. good. That's I'm good. They're, <laughs> you know, they're into that. I really am glad, you know, the both of them. That's good. And, and, and that cultivates growth and cultivates community. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful, you know. And again, I, I, I think I have a, I don't, I don't know if, uh, I don't know, I would like to hear what Victor has to say, but I, I have a double whammy because I remember when I first got here and uh, December 24th, there's a service in church. And that was so weird for me because December 24th was for Cubans, it's time when you get together with family, uh, your biological family, and you go and you have a dinner, or whatever, and you don't really do a church service. And, you know, even a Spanish church, I never recall them doing like a Christmas Eve service. Maybe they did, but I guess I never went or something. But um, for, for so I have a double whammy with some certain issues. I'm like, you know, or even when they celebrate certain things like Thanksgiving, I'm like, okay, that's nice, but that's not really a Christian thing. Uh, Christmas, I understand. Uh, Easter, I definitely. Easter to me is the most important. That to me is the real. That's a real Christian celebration because we we know about the resurrection of Christ. The birth of Christ is not really December 25th, so you can't get me on that one either. So, uh, you know, so yeah, I, don't, I don't have that attachment to those days either. That's why I feel like Paul, I feel like when Paul says, you know, to one person, certain days are special. To the other person, no day is special. For me, it's like no day is special. I mean, if you ask me what days are special, be like, yeah, the birth of my daughter, my her birthday, that's a special day. But, other, you know, Easter is a special day. Uh, my wife's birthday, my birthday, but, uh, you know, I don't really think of, I don't have like special days like Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, that's, that just, the, so even there I have like, wow, I'm in, I'm in bad shape, you know, so uh, how about no, you, Victor? But it's good for the children, though. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, <laughs> it's them together. Did you have that also, Victor, when you came, you said the American church as opposed to the Spanish church as opposed to your own culture? No. Um... I never really went to a Spanish church, only once by accident. And, uh, you know, we don't have Thanksgiving in South America or Halloween. So I, would ne I, was, uh, I never felt left out. Yeah. And Christmas, I, I never participated because uh, 
it was very Catholic, you know, you go to a Christmas Eve on the 24th to a... Oh, there you go, the there you go. A special that. mass, and I never went there. See, to us, for, Christmas was just uh, to blow up, uh, you know, fireworks, that was all. Yeah, and for Christians, I mean, the, for Cubans, uh, Christmas is January 6th, not December 25th. Yeah. January, January, is January 6th right. is the, the celebration of the Magi. Uh, and that's when uh, Cubans celebrate Christmas. So when my mom got here, she had to alter that because she wanted us to be able to fit in and feel comfortable with other children. So we started celebrating December 25th. But then I noticed that January 6th, she would always do something also. And I, I finally, you know, as a kid, I finally asked her, why are you doing something January 6th? It's not Christmas. It's, for us, it is Christmas. Something yeah. like that is my father's church. They used to have it. We always mm -hmm. held up all the Christmas stuff up until a week after before we took anything down. He was with the Orthodox Church. There you go. I see. Yeah. Well, the Orthodox celebrate also. Yeah. They, I think they probably have like a January 6th also. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I never went. <laughs> because my father wasn't a church goer. But we went because my mother had a friend who was a, uh, used to go out and teach people and that's how my mother got to go to the church and we all got to go we all went you know but one thing i could say about my father he never told us not to go to church that we had to go to the church that he belonged to which he didn't go anyway <laughs> but he never told us that we couldn't go yeah there you go well yeah. again for, for for paul here in this passage he he like i said he doesn't just want individuals to develop he wants all christians to develop um and he's really heartbroken because again you know when you uh when you when you give birth to something you know where every mother understands that when you give birth to your children if you see them go in a wayward way you see them going mm -hmm. uh wrong it just breaks your heart and paul really shows the real intimacy of, of, of a mother um mm -hmm. he, first of all using mother languages you know people my my feels weird, but not for Paul. Paul really understands that intimacy. You know, in, in Corinthians, for example, he says, you know, that he's that he's a father to them. He said, "You may have many teachers, but you have only one father." Father, so, yeah. Because he helped them to come to know Lord. But here he uses motherly language, and uh, he's just heartbroken. And he says he wishes he could be there, uh, but he cannot. And the reason I think he cannot be is because right now Paul's in the middle of the whole conflict. Of this whole circumcision issue and i believe that at this point he's preparing himself uh with barnabas to head to jerusalem uh to have the jerusalem council in acts chapter 15. so they're preparing for that because all the this is really blown up with the, with everything that happened in antioch everything that's happening in galatia um these people are now you know they realize we need, we need to have a meeting we need to talk about this and so he says you know i wish i could be with you and the speculation is that he probably can't because he's heading off to Jerusalem to take care of this council and deal with the whole issue of, of what the Gentiles need to do in order to, uh, to be part of the family of God. Mm -hmm. Any question? Mm -mm. Right. And he, was he married? No, no, no. I didn't think he was married. Well, you know, it was, always, it was debated whether he was because he was a Pharisee. And um in in later was that he had a turn in the flesh he had a turn in the flesh his wife he was um he was a pharisee so in in later pharisaical tradition a pharisee a rabbi had to be married and so they have presumed that paul may have been married and that he became a widow oh. and, and a widower and um, this, was the, this was the common held belief because of this text. But later on, they discovered these texts were liter literally from the second, third century. So it, it maybe it's something that came into effect later, but not in the, uh, not in the uh, early rabbinical style. So maybe uh, some rabbis were single, they were, they were celibate. So from what I can tell, it doesn't appear that he was married. Mm. Um, you know, he even says that he wishes that everyone was like him, and he means single. Uh, he doesn't associate himself with the widowers, he associates himself with those who are celibate, those who have never been married. 
So I think he's never he was never married to begin with. You know. So and he never never had a desire to do so. And he and, you know he talks about the gift of being single and the gift of being married. Some people have the gift of being married, they can't be alone. And some people have the gift of being single. And yet he he believed that people also could choose. That people could choose to remain celibate, like he had done. And uh, you know, so the, there's not like only one road to take. There are many roads that can be taken, many, many ways. You know, somebody might start out uh, married and then remain and then go into celibacy or be a celibate and then get married. You know? Uh, so uh, you never know. You never know what can happen. And that's kind of like I heard the story about the the one priest, the, the, the guy who used to be the, the pastor, the priest at uh, Epiphany. Not Epiphany, sorry. The Episcopalian Church. Um, before this one now, because this one's this one's different. Before this one, there was another there was another priest there. And he was he had actually was studying to be a Catholic priest, but he fell in love with this girl, he wanted to marry her. And so he actually left the priesthood. He got married, and then he became he became a, an Episcopalian priest. Good. Yeah, because he just wanted, you know. Although today is very weird. It's, it's very different today. I heard that there are, if a priest, um, for example, myself, I'm married. So if I decide to convert to Catholicism, they would let me be a priest. Really? And be married. So they, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah they, they have changed the rules. Because wow. they said that they were going to change it. Oh, yeah, they did change it. A while back, that anybody could get married. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a guy who is married, let's say, belongs to a, I don't know, a Episcopalian or a whatever, and then becomes a Catholic priest, being married, and then they get divorced, and the wife sues the Vatican. <laughs> Why would the wife sue the Vatican? Because that's the only way that she can get money. That's the only. That's the reason why they don't allow Catholic priests to get married. Good luck on that one. I don't see how you're gonna. I, <laughs> why, I don't. I don't see you being able to get a, a a lawyer better than the Vatican can get a okay, lawyer. Okay. If if a, how how is she gonna get child support or alimony if it's married to a Catholic priest? To get it through the priest. But the priest doesn't earn any money. Oh, well, he does. He gets paycheck. Oh. <laughs> Are you kidding? How can no. the priest not get paid? Down there in, is a what, a, what, what do they do that, to earn money? The priest. I don't know, but I, 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 I they don't earn money. They're retired. Somehow they must get something. No, they, they get because money. Because look at that priest in Tenek they were all fighting about. He, he retired in this big, beautiful million dollar home down nice. near the shore. And he wanted to put, I forget what is, some. I don't remember. He wanted to put, do something to the place. Mm -hmm. I think put a big uh, for swimming or something. Yeah. Oh, there was a big to do. It was in the paper. That's the only reason why I know from Tenic. Do you remember that? No, no. No. But I'm going to look it up because I can't imagine a priest not getting paid. I mean, how do you buy your stuff? How do you buy your how do you they, do they support it by the Vatican? Everything. Everything. So if I go out and buy groceries, they pay for my groceries. They pay everything for my, is paid by the Vatican. They pay for my books. They pay for everything. Everything. I mean, well, clothes. They only, they only wear a, a uniform. Well, no, but the uniform, but also about where do I wear, what about when I, I just go out? <laughs> huh? They, they don't go out. They, they just wear the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the same not, thing over and over. Not all the time. Not all the time. They can, they can. All the time. Yeah, no, come on. Why, why would they put civilian clothes? No. I gotta, I gotta look. That, I gotta look that up. I'm not a priest. So I gotta look it up. No, no. They, they have to put it by the Vatican. That's I'll why call, they don't get married. If I doubt it, I, I'm gonna call the other priest from Epiphany and ask him. He doesn't know. Uh, well, if, he, if he's a priest in Epiphany, I know. he wouldn't know whether he gets a paycheck or not. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to ask. Will sue, the, the wife will sue the Vatican for everything they got. That's why they don't allow to get married because right. the Vatican don't want to be put in that position. Well. The, like oh, I said, the, the oh rules are changed. Well, like I said, the rules are changed. <laughs> With the money that they get? Oh, come on. And like I told oh, you. Now, if, if that's the case, what's the level of uh, of money they get? I mean, what priest gets more money than the other priest? What do they do to earn more money? Well, how I, do they get everything? I they, don't, they, don't, they don't get they, money. I would think they, that they would oh, get they paid. They must get from somewhere. I would they think must, that they get they paid just like a pastor gets paid. 
it's according you know for example uh, i get paid according they 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 match my salary and stuff according to the standard of living in the area you live in so if you live in a very in a place where the standard of living is ten thousand dollars then you don't get a hundred thousand but if you live in a place where it's affluent they pay you according to uh your living style the fact of that of that community i get paid according to uh what, you are not a catholic uh, priest I, well i'm gonna look it up don't worry about it. i'm gonna look it up and if i don't if i if i can't find it i'm gonna i'm gonna call a priest and ask them you call me <laughs> i won't tell you the truth i'm gonna father father i got a question for you father <laughs> you call him father hmm? bible says don't call anybody father well no but that's not what it means because obviously even right now sonia paul said that you have many many teachers but i only have one father so you know, I wouldn't call a, a Catholic priest father. No, but that's not that's not what the Bible means. When not not that. anymore. No, but I'm saying that's not. I'm I'm not saying whether you will call him a father or not. I'm saying that's not what the Bible means, because obviously Paul was first said, "I I am I am your father." So obviously, if he said that, he had to know the teachings of Jesus. He's not contradicting Christ. So I cannot mean, or you cannot call somebody who, who spiritually gave birth to you, helped you, whatever, a father. Um, so that that that's obviously not what Matthew means. Is that what you? Is that what uh, when you did the study on Matthew? Is that what you came up with? That it was a. Uh, I was came up with that thing. Is that what it came? That's that's what. I'm gonna stick to it. No, no, no. I mean, I know you. I know you did a study on Matthew. Was that yeah. that was your conclusion that it meant? Well, no, that I, that was before I I did a study on Matthew. Well, when you did Matthew, what did you come up with? I, I don't recall that that uh, any explanation besides you're what have, I you're said. You have to go back to because think about it. If it is, if it says don't call any any man father, I mean, what about your biological father? What do you call him? Fred. I mean, that, that's the only father. Only two people. Well, no, but in heaven and your biological father. But that's not what it says in that passage that you're referencing. It says call no man on earth father. That's literally my good King James that I that's, that's still my mind. <laughs> You know, that's what it says. Call no man on earth father. So we're gonna have to look up that verse and uh you see that and come back, come back to my uh my friend here about that. What book is it in? It's the, it's the gospel of Matthew. Matthew. Call no man father. Okay, we'll have to come back to that one. All right. All right. Um let's go on next to the next passage. Galatians okay. chapter four, verses twenty-one to chapter five, verse one. And again, would you, uh, Victor, would you kindly read that for us? Which one from 21 to what? To chapter 5, verse 1. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a copy of uh, Galatians 4. I didn't go to 5. Okay, let me read I'll, this. I'll read the verse 1. Just go to finish Galatians 4 then. Okay. First, verse 21. Tell me. You who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of the divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands, stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written Be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud. You who never, who never in labor, were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are ch uh, children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the, spirit, the scripture said? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share an inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we're not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Then chapter 5, verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set, set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Hmm. Amen. Any initial questions? 
must have been terrible for Abraham to let uh, Hagar and Ishmael go because it was his son, you know? Yeah. And uh, he did just what the woman, what uh, Sarah, told him, Sarah told him to do. Yeah. Well, it was all on her. Yeah. But, uh, but again, it was, uh, it was, as Paul says here, it was a decision of the flesh. Right. Not a decision of God. Uh, yet God, of course, uh, in Genesis 16, 13, says that he will bless Ishmael and also multiply him and make, make a, 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 many people on him and make a great nation of him as well. So, you know, he's still blessed because he is a child of Abraham, but not the child of the promise. But this passage, if a Jew read this passage and read all of Galatians at this point, this is where the Jew, who's not a Christian, mm -hmm. <laughs> would rip his shirt. <laughs> really? And say, because what Paul is literally saying in his passage is the real children of Abraham are those according to the promise. Those right. who are part of the law, under the law, are children of the flesh. Those are the children of a Hagar. Right. Who are the children of Hagar? Not the Arabic people. No, no, no. He would say anyone who doesn't know Christ is a child of Hagar. Anyone who follows the law. So he would look at Jews today and say, those are the children of Hagar. Those are the children of the flesh. They're not the children of promise. The children of promise, you would say today, are the Christians. The ones who are according to faith. And if you're a Jew, a Gentile, male, female, slave, free, it doesn't matter as long as you have Christ. This, is, this, is, this passage is as blasphemous as you're going to get in the writings of Paul if, if a Jewish person is reading it. And see, we read it so casually like nothing. Uh, but when we go through, you see that, oh, my goodness, he really, he is nailing the, the nail in the coffin. He's saying this, this, this is the way it really is. Um, mm. and, uh, and just shutting out. And in the contrary, not only saying those who are following Torah are of the flesh. doesn't matter if they're Jews or Gentiles. So if, if a Gentile wants to follow Torah, fine. Then you're a child of the flesh. What's the answer? Get rid of them. Throw them out of the congregation. That's that's heavy duty. That's I'm sorry. That's we're going to get into real hardcore. And this is actually what Paul does also seven years later in Romans nine through eleven, which has been so unfortunately perverted because of the whole Calvinist Arminian thing uh, mm -hmm. that that we lost the real meaning of it. But thank God that more and more uh, biblical scholars are are coming back to what Paul meant that he was talking about the true Jew the real believer, as opposed to uh, those of the flesh, just like he does here. So this is actually the beginning of that great argument that he will have seven years later. Only, uh, unfortunately, that one's been perverted, but this one still remains intact, thank God. So any, any questions before I, before we dive into it a little bit before we no. finish? Okay. Um, this, is, this, again, is another irony of Paul, because in chapter 4, verse 21, uh, as it indicates, he's quoting Torah, in order to say you must not submit to Torah, that this is beauty. You you can't you can't you can't write this kind of script for people, someone like Paul. Says, um, you know, tell me who you you who want to be under the law. Are you not aware of what the law says? You know, mm. he, basically, he basically quotes the Old Testament to say don't accept those under Torah. That yeah. means you, I you know only Paul can get away with something like that. But that deliberate irony is held within the argument of chapter 3, where Paul has carefully, almost clinically, distinguished between the covenant with Abraham and the covenant at Sinai. He has, he has cut down the line and made it very clear there are two covenants here. One's the covenant with Abraham, one's the covenant with Moses. And there were Jews that were under both, and there were Jews that were under one. If you're under the covenant of Abraham, you're saved. That's all that matters. If you're under only the covenant of the law of Moses, then you're not of you're not of the family of Abraham. You're not of the queen of the promise. Uh, and he does it very, I mean, cutting it right down the, the middle. In a sense, all that he says here is, is doing is drawing out further, more devastating implications of what he's already said in chapter three. In three uh, one to four uh, four eleven, he insists that all Messiah believers are members of Abraham's one single true family. And now here he finally insists that those who teach the opposite should be expelled from the community. They should not be allowed. Now, an important question arises, and um, here, you know, you might think, 
Does this man ever disagree with N.T. Wright? Here's a play where I disagree with N.T. Wright. Um, this is a question that arises, keeps arising as we look at Paul's letters. Are these individuals that are opposing Paul, are they real believers? Uh, N.T. Wright believes that they are real believers, that Paul believes that they have simply failed to realize the truth about the gospel. And what Paul is calling for is discipline within the congregation. I disagree. I think Paul is saying these individuals are not really believers because what they're preaching is another gospel. He made it very clear, Galatians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. If anybody preaches another gospel, let them be anathema. Let them be eternally condemned. Paul doesn't know a middle ground. When Paul talks about discipline, he means a Christian who is sinning. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man who is sleeping with his, uh, with his stepmother, he's a believer. He's in the congregation. Discipline him. Get him on the right track or, again, excommunicate him. If he will not repent, if he will not turn around, throw him out. Have nothing to do with him. But there are, there are stages of reform that Paul, Paul permits. But if someone is not preaching the gospel, there is no room for discipline because they're not Christians. If somebody comes to our congregation and they start preaching Torah and saying, we have to follow the law, we have to become Jewish, we get rid of them. We don't say, to them, oh, we're going to give you a little platform where you can share your message and, and uh, we can have that. That could be an aspect of our teaching ministry. No, I would throw them out. I have, I have no doubt about where Paul stands. I know the difference between different flavors of Christian and non-Christian. Anyone who says you need to follow the law in order to be right with God, in order to be right with Christ, is not preaching the gospel. Now, in the gospel, so far as our, our evangelical faith, we have different flavors. You have Christians that lean this way on one thing and lean this way on the other. Uh, and so when I see evangelicals, especially because that's, that's my barometer, I don't go by liberal Christians because they're off the board. They're, they're, not, they're not even on the board. I go by evangelical Christians, and you see what they disagree about. Let's say, you know, women in leadership. You know, there are evangelical Christians who say women should not be pastors. There are evangelical Christians who say women should be pastors. No problem. So I, I leave the spectrum open. Uh, there are evangelical Christians who are Calvinists. There are evangelical Christians who are Arminians. So I leave the spectrum open. Of course, maybe I'm a little more close-minded on that one. And, <laughs> and don't allow, <laughs> would not allow, I, I don't think I would allow a, a Calvinist to be teaching Sunday school or to be teaching the youth group or, or you know. Uh, I'm not even sure if I would lend them, lend them out the pulpit, but maybe I would, but I'm not sure. Um, well, I guess I have because, uh, because uh, Rativa's children, are, uh, Cyril and, uh, and Nicole, lean to the Calvinist side. So I, I, and, I, and they have shared my pulpit, so I guess they're. But I knew they, were, they weren't going to get out on the pulpit and say something, something uh, radical. I knew they were going to preach the gospel, so I was, I was safe ground. But yeah, there's, there, there are spectrums where we can, there are things we can agree with and disagree with, and we can allow room for that obviously when when christians are sinning we don't agree with their sinning and our job is to stop them from what they're doing mm -hmm. and if there's a process by which we try to deal with that sinfulness try to get them on track try to get it right but if they will not listen to reason if they will not uh, uh stay under the discipline of the church then they have to leave you know and in this church, there's only been one case, uh, actually in the whole history of the church. I, I, thought it, I thought that it had been more, but I found out afterwards that I, I had been the only person that's ever done this in the history of the church, that I brought somebody before the congregation because they just, they just, uh, they wouldn't stop doing what they were doing. Mm. And, um, and finally, and then when they were put on their discipline, rather than remaining within the congregation, they left. Mm which means that they would never be allowed to come back in unless they were willing to. And I, I, I was even, I even, uh, I even compromised because I allowed them to be disciplined under a former pastor of this church because I respected him. And that's, you know, and I realized they would be uncomfortable with me, no problem, but they had to be with him and they never were with him. They never went to the, never sat down with him, never dealt with their, their problem. Um, so they, they left. But that's been the only case. Um, everything else I've tried to deal with, and then when you when you finally try to deal with it, people normally leave. They don't, you know, um, they don't stay. But that's discipline. But that's different from heresy. 
that's different from somebody getting up and preaching a different gospel. And we have to draw a clear line. And I believe Paul here in this whole, in this whole letter is drawing a very clear line. And he knows the difference between Christians who are messing up and people who are not Christian. And again, I disagree with N.T. Wright, who I think is, is trying to be very ecumenical, trying to be very uh, nice here. But no, I, I don't believe Paul. I think believe Paul, and he knows this because he knows that Paul is harsh. He always quotes that, you know, as many times in his lectures, he'll talk about Paul and he'll say that, um, he'll quote that bishop that says, you know, when Paul went into a town, there were riots. When I go into town, they give me tea. You know, they, you know, it's like, you know, Paul, Paul was a very black and white sort of man. You didn't mess around with Paul. Paul, if you're not preaching the gospel, he says exactly what he says in chapter one. If you're not preaching the gospel, may you be eternally condemned. He says, if I'm not preaching the gospel, may I be eternally condemned. If an angel preaches a different gospel, let them be eternally condemned. He is very harsh. And so I don't think, I think he's already drawn the lines in chapter one. And here he makes it very clear. Get rid of these people. Do not entertain them. Which is the same thing that John in his, I think is his second letter, a uh, very small letter, second John. He talks about that, about not entertaining people who are heretics. You know, don't. Don't talk to them. Don't let them inside your house. Don't don't give them any bread. Don't don't have fellowship with them. Don't even listen to them. So again, a very clear line has to be drawn between discipline and heresy. And I think Paul here is saying these people are heretical. They're preaching a different gospel. Get rid of them. Any questions? Okay. Verses twenty one to twenty three. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of the divine promise. Obviously, Paul is only using two sons because that's what the that's the illustration that he's using. And he's not, he doesn't want to get into technical issues about Isaac and Ishmael like he will in, uh, in Romans 9. And he will use the name. Here he's just using it like a, like a metaphor, like an illustration. As he'll say, it's, uh, you know, figuratively speaking. He's not focused on the actual uh, historical individuals, but on what they represent, what they mean. Uh, he says, you who want to be under the law. Paul's words seem to be addressed not only to the Galatians, but to these agitators who come in. You want to be under the law? This is the kind of person you want to be? That's fine. Um, the likelihood is that those who are agitating the congregation will probably be there. They, they have infiltrated the, remember Paul says that they have come in to spy our freedom. They're in the congregation. Uh, they're, they're hanging out with the Galatian believers. So when this letter is read, they will hear it. They will hear this letter being read in the congregation. And they will have no doubt about what Paul says. Um, the word want here refers to a basic resolve uh, of the misdirected will. Um, something you want, but it's perverse. It's bad. It's wrong. But if that's what you want, then go ahead. Uh, but aren't you aware of what the law says? They're so eager to be under the law, but they do not know what it means to be under the law. Uh, Paul has uh, chapter 16 and 20 and uh, to 21 of Genesis in mind here. He begins in verse 22 with a simple summary and ends in verse 31 with a simple conclusion. Verse 22, Abraham had two, two, two sons from two women. Verse 31, the, the, we are the children of the free woman, not of the slave. Get rid of the other ones. Uh, very simple, very uh, clear cut. It is quite possible that the rival teachers have been pointing out that Abraham had two sons and two families, and they, are, of course, are of the Isaac family. This is, of course, part of the Jewish boasting. We are children of Abraham. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is their great lineage. This is their boast. Uh, and they certainly would, uh, would throw it in anybody's face. Paul will have to work step by step through the features of the story to refute this. And he starts at the point that his previous argument suggests with the categories of slave and free. He had already brought in the issue of those who are slaves, those who are free. Now he's using that here in this story as well. So he sets up the two categories, slave and free, flesh and promise. And again, flesh is also going to be a good springboard to lead him then to the next chapter between spirit, uh, mm -hmm. between flesh and spirit. So you see the connections that he makes. He used the language of slave and free to talk about those being in Christ, to now talk about those who are divided. 
and uh, those who belong to slavery, the real slavery is not uh, the household slave, it's not the person who's, who's been sold in slavery. The real slave is the person under the law. It's the person who's following Moses in the Torah. The person who's really free is not a person who can walk around wherever they want to. Uh, it's a person who knows Christ. That's the person who's really free. Uh, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. Hagar, of course, is a slave. She was the concubine to Sarah. Sarah, of course, is the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. In the ordinary way, in the Greek, actually, is kata sarka, according to the flesh, which, of course, already, you know, Paul's putting a, a negative spin on it, because normally when Paul uses the word sar sarkas, flesh, he always has him to have a negative connotation. And here, definitely. He's saying the child of, uh, born to Hagar and Abraham was born of the flesh. It was of human desire. It was humans trying to manipulate the will of God. Humans trying to create the family of God. And that was not permissible. You know, uh, Abraham and, and Hagar was really, again, like, like uh, Victor pointed out, was, really came out first from, uh, from Sarah. Who, who basically, since he had this uh, you know, concubine, which was like an extra womb, uh, says, to, says to, uh, to Abraham, hey, you know, since I can't give you a child, go, go be with Hagar. She'll have a child and it'll be our child. So they're trying to create the promise of God, which, of course, is, it's a very human thing to do. You know, God tells us, oh, I'm going I'm to give you this. I'm going to do this for you. And what do we do? We try to go in and do it ourselves. We try to bring about the promise of God. And this is what, it, what, uh, what Sarah and Abraham end up doing. They try to, they're trying to force the promise of God. And God was like, no, when, when God is going to give this child, the whole point of Isaac is that it's the child of promise. It is a child that comes through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that Sarah and Abraham could have done on their own. On the contrary, when they finally have this child, they're both past the age of anything. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're supremely old, you know, even by our standards, they're supremely old. But even within that culture, they were already old. They were past the age of childbearing. And she was. Well, she was. Yes, she was. Which, of course, that's where the child comes from. I mean, you know, you need you need both. It takes two to tangle. Um, but they were past that point, And it, ha it came about because God did it. Mm -hmm. God said this is going to happen. And then when it was ready, then God said, this time next year, Sarah will be pregnant. You will have a child. And so, again, they were trying to force the hand of God, force the promise of God, and they can't. Uh, this is the completely the work of grace, the complete the work of God. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. He was born because God had promised Abraham that he would have a son through Sarah. Sarah was incapable of conceiving. The child did not come about because Abraham and Sarah kept working at it until she finally got pregnant. Uh, no matter how much they worked at it, it was not going to happen. And uh, so, of course, Paul builds these two categories. And I'll send you a, a little clipping, you know, of uh, I have a little chart. And you'll see it when I send it to you. But, you know, the chart is Hagar and Sarah, you know, slave free, according to flesh, through promise, present Jerusalem, Jerusalem above, flesh, spirit, persecuted, persecuted, will not inherit, will inherit. A uh, very, very uh, uh, detailed way of bringing things down the line. Any questions? Okay, we're going to stop there. Because next, when we get to verse 24 to 27, there's more. I have a lot of notes on that, so I don't want to go into those verses. So we're going to stop here. Okay. And, uh, but at least we got, a, we, got our, we got our foot in the door on this story, which to me is like, it's a phenomenal passage. Phenomenal. And again, uh, if... For us, it's not longer any, sh it's not shocking because we've gotten used to language. We're used to the passage. We read it. But I'm telling you, if, if when they read this, when they heard this, those who were Jews, according to the, according to the, to the law, they would know exactly what Paul was saying. They would have seen this as blasphemous. Hmm. He was basically saying those who follow Torah are children of Hagar. <laughs> you're not sure. You see, you're getting it. When you laugh, you're getting it. You see the, the whoa, what a scandal. That is a scandal. Right. So again, who are the children of, of Sarah? The, the believers. Who are the children of Hagar? Those who do not accept Christ. Those who follow the law. The Jews. Mm. 
You know, so today, if you imagine you went to synagogue and say, yeah, you guys are children of Hagar. They would be, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what Paul's telling them. And he's just extremely, um, talk about shock therapy. He's, he's really at this point, this, this, is, the, this is really the, the climax of the argument. He's really in full, full throttle here. Any, any questions, comments before we? Uh, mm -mm. Okay, let me say hi bye to Facebook there. And again, thank God this thing is working out because um, 